have to defeat my seven evil exes. Oh my god! In all the time I won. I'll show you the All of that chit chat's gonna get you hurt. Oh my god. Nice outfit. I'm the joker, mate. In the yeti! In our modern world where nerd culture has been thrust into the spotlight and given the attention that it rightfully deserves, there is one image at its core, often accompanied with a striking yellow oval background, but always including an iconic symbol in the shape of a bat. Batman is a universally beloved, celebrated, and recognized character that stands head and shoulders above the very medium that birthed him, so much so that even the most geekless of individuals will represent his iconography upon both their clothes clothing, and even their skin. Batman, at his very core, appeals to even the most common of individuals. A child experiences a life-defining and world-shattering trauma and responds to it by redirecting his anger and depression into assisting those less fortunate than him. In all interpretations of Batman, there are many constants that define his character and self, those being his unshakable morals, unwavering determination, and incredibly relatable vulnerability. However, in his countless interpretations, the Bat harbors many different means of embodying these attributes. In some, he is the most squeaky clean of heroes, encouraging children to stay in school and do good deeds in their community. In others, he is a brooding entity of vengeance, becoming a borderline criminal vigilante that reflects the twisted morality of the city he defends. In most, he rides that fine line between the two, upholding his personal code and striking fear in the hearts of the common street thug. No matter the interpretation, there is one thing that remains a key part of the Dark Knight and his stories. Batman is a mere man. Even in his worst of interpretations, Batman is still shown to be a human being, one that could theoretically be killed just as easily as you and I. One of the things that separates us from him, however, is the determination of this one man, his willingness to stare down overwhelming odds and face the challenge head on. Batman, no matter how Jack suited up or bizarre, still has an ounce of humanity in him that can usually pique the interest of the common individual. Thus, it should be no surprise that he is, above all, the superhero icon that is most commonly presented in just about every aspect of our modern day pop culture. Athletes, big and small, wear Batman-themed clothing to the gym, sold in nearly any store that provides said sportswear. Teenagers, in their brooding darkness of feeling alone and misunderstood, connect to him and his rogues gallery of iconic villains. Children flock to Batman, in awe of his cool gadgets and toys, wild adventures, and his intimate touch of violence. These children remain ever ecstatic to receive any number of Batman-related toys. Similarly, even our favorite toy-loving adults, the millionaires and billionaires of America, can't help but look at the Batmobile with envy and inspiration. I'm sure it would be no stretch of imagination for me to make the claim that countless more individuals from every one of these all-encompassing groups have fantasized about the concept of becoming the Batman. To take justice into your own hands, to fight crime, to wear tight, dark clothing emblazoned with such a beaming icon, to be feared, to be respected, to be loved. I have personally met countless individuals who adore Batman, and with that admittedly meager admiration, have proudly claimed their title of nerd. Many a young person who has never opened a comic, rarely touched a video game, only pops into the movies once every Marvel or Spider-Man movie release, I have conversed with, all proudly proclaiming themselves as a certified nerd. In my opinion, whether the title is deserved or not isn't a pressing topic for debate. Instead, what is far more interesting is this notion of Batman being the perfect entry point into the world of pop culture and nerddom on large. It isn't an uncommon question to ask a room full of individuals their personal preference of interpretation of the world's greatest detective and receive a multitude of unique answers. For some of my older Bat fans, it's that Michael Keaton original. He was many's first encounter with the Caped Crusader 
character, and his pairing with Jack Nicholson's Joker only elevated the lasting impression. But then, another person in the room would step in to argue they really didn't connect with our hero until Batman Returns. The leather and latex just spoke volumes, perhaps an awakening, sexual or otherwise. Speaking of sexual awakenings, what if someone stepped in and made their case for Batman and Robin, or even Batman Forever? But maybe that wasn't enough camp for you. You grew up on what you consider to be peak Batman. 1960s television Batman starring Adam West. That bomb scene in the subsequent film? Mwah. Peak cinema for sure. Too much for you? You like the brooding dark Batman? Perhaps the Christopher Nolan films are your thing. That's my Batman, you say. Perhaps you're a strict diehard. No movie has ever nailed what makes Batman so appealing to you. The comics are the only place he's felt like something you can relate to. Or maybe you're a true Bat fan of class, a fan of the animated form. After all, there are so many examples to choose from, and they all contain the best parts of every previously mentioned version of Batman that you could ever hope for. When it's time to be dark, they get dark. When it's time to be campy, they camp it up. When it's time to throw down, oh boy, do they throw down. Regardless of which of these many versions of Batman you choose to lay claim to, quote-unquote, my Batman, all choices hold validity. They all possess unique qualities to attach yourself to. Saying which Batman is your Batman is to say so much about yourself as a person. In just one example, you explain your values your expectations, what you desire from the caped crusader, and maybe even yourself. However, while the values we hold dear are unique to all of us, and as beautiful a thing as that is, there's also something beautiful about how all this discussion spawns from the same character with the same basic principles. Unique to us is the image of Batman in our mind. Universal to us is the symbol of what he stands for. And that is a better human. A better, more disciplined, more focused, idyllic version of you and me. Someone who faced the worst the world could throw at him, and overcame it through adversity. With this description, it almost comes across as no surprise that Batman is the powerhouse of an icon that he is today. I'm the hairiest hair, and typically I would usher you along in a discussion regarding one of the many video games that touched my life. Tonight, however, let us gather on the rooftops of Gotham City and take it all in. It is not enough for me to make a simple video discussing the 2009 smash hit Batman Arkham Asylum. Because to invoke the name of that game is to unravel something far deeper within. A discussion I've been dying to have for most of my entire life. An analysis of a video game will not be enough to satisfy me on this night. Instead, I wish to paint for you a much fuller image. I desire to touch on how important Batman remains to our current era of pop culture. He and his iconography are weaved into our lives so seamlessly that by now I barely raise an eyebrow when I see a bat symbol or hear someone in a low rasp say, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I am Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. That's Batman. <laughs> On a much more personal note, Batman isn't just some cool superhero of my choosing, nor is it as simple as a character I relate to and find deep love and attraction towards, no. Arkham Asylum and Batman both stand as testament to the early precursors of my very core. Who I am as a person is because of these things, thus, tonight, I do not utter the word Batman so lightly. I intend to sit here and break down both the game and the entire timeline of my existence. Why it is that I I am the way I am, as well as why the Dark Knight is to blame. Allow for me to impress upon you so deeply this message. Batman has been, and always will be, my own personal cornerstone of pop culture. Some days, it's difficult to imagine a time prior to being fascinated in the many worlds of fiction. I have been to nearly every state in the country. I have sampled so many cuisines here and there. I have slept in many a bed, miles upon miles away from the one I called mine. During these journeys, I have stepped into a multitude of museums. I have perused art beyond my comprehension, touched pieces of history that are immensely important in the grand scheme of the soil I stand on. My early years are so jam-packed with information that I would equate it to a room full of incredible treasures. A room so vast and full that each individual treasure remains elegant and beautiful, but together they are just an image, a thought, something with very little substance beyond what it represents. I cannot recall most of these memories. I do not remember most faces and certainly not the names that accompanied them. In my earliest of memories, only a few select spotlights stand out so strongly. Firstly, I remember being really into NASCAR for a small 
small period in my life. Incredibly interesting considering not only my opinion of it today, but also because I do not remember anything other than the images of the cars. I made a collage of different shots and angles of the race cars carefully cut out of magazines, glued together into such beautiful chaos upon a tin bucket. The bucket would one day be where I kept my change, the savings of a small child with no real allowance or income. However, what were the names of those driving the vehicles? What were the rules of NASCAR? If I ever knew the answers, I didn't remember them for very long. Eventually, that flame died out. Sure, cars did, in fact, go vroom, and most kids of my description are pretty into that. But looking back, I realized that maybe I didn't like NASCAR for any reason other than it was convenient. It was available. It was there, in my home. Because as soon as I gained proper autonomy, I realized I just really did not care about NASCAR. So too did that flame of interest fizzle out in the interest of sports. Much to the disappointment of the legendary individual known as Voodoo, my father, football gave me only a passing curiosity. American football is entertaining, don't get me wrong, but every time I heard adults talk about it, I found myself completely lacking the passion for it that they clearly carried. To love this team was easy. To hate that team did not come as easy. Maybe the problem wasn't that I couldn't find that hatred inside of me. Maybe it's just that I didn't care about football. Voodoo was also well known as a basketball mark. He loved the sport, hopped in and played it with his mates all the time. He even would go on to coach high school basketball for many years in the future. It should come as no surprise then that my parents would eventually enroll me into basketball programs many years over. This wasn't necessarily a forced activity. I did say I wanted to do it. Truth be told, I have a hand full of fond memories that are basketball related. It was something that I was never good at, but I could grasp it for at least a few years of my life. Basketball was enjoyable to play, but in the end, I lacked the drive to learn and grow in my abilities. A careless adult would call this laziness. Looking back now, I realize it wasn't that simple. I just really did not care about basketball. You might imagine this is the part where I say I stumbled upon my first Batman comic and instantly fell in love. But no. Even with my artistic background, my first couple of comic books inspired nothing within me. Even in the world of a comic book, there was nothing for me to latch onto. Even in art, I just couldn't care. Perhaps you are noticing the trend of many early years. One problem at the heart of everything that would pop up as a persistent plaguing problem throughout my prepubescent life. I was an extremely apathetic child. I had so much that was afforded to me, was full of so much potential. I wanted many things in life, but cared about so very few. There was no drive in me, no desire to become something more, no desire to gain something my life had been without. I can't even sit here and fabricate that I had an interest in trying to find that something I needed in my life. I just didn't care. There was only one thing that everyone knew I loved. Something that came so natural to me that I didn't even consider it being one of my passions until it had already sown its seeds into every single facet of my being. In my life, there was only one guarantee. I really, really cared about video games. So naturally, when I would be begrudgingly dragged along to the local Walmart, you knew where to find me when you were done. But one day was different. That Xbox 360 demo kiosk shimmered with a different glow. There was something new. Illuminating off of the uncomfortably high television screen was a game I had never seen before. And every time the family had a reason to visit that Walmart, I no longer felt annoyed. I no longer moaned and groaned. In this ugly, run-of-the-mill, underutilized section of an average everyday Walmart lay the thing I had been missing. Within this thick, plastic-protected display lay what I sought. Motivation inspiration, determination, something to care about. The two separate realities of Batman and video games have been bumping shoulders since 1986. Since then, Mr. Vengeance has been consistently included in the digital gaming world, sometimes with unique inspirations, but most commonly with movie tie-in interpretations, typically in the style of beat-em-ups, vehicle combat simulators, and the ever-common combination of the two. While at the time, these games were what was expected of an attempt to bring Batman to the world of interactive gameplay, they lacked innovation. As years progressed, players 
began to feel jaded and bored with the classic beat-em-up formula. This fade in appreciation began to spell disaster as time went on, and Batman games seemed unable to adapt with the changing times. Regardless of its origins or its release date, Batman had rarely felt like a successful pillar of gaming, especially when looking at some of his later additions to the gaming landscape. Titles like Dark Tomorrow for the Xbox and GameCube were given absolutely scathing reviews, sinking the reputation of the Caped Crusader further into the realm of disappointment and mishandling. You'll let me go? Yes. As long as going to is what you had in mind. In 2005, Batman Begins took a stab at handling the stealthy side of Batman, met with middling reception. Uh, for the record, there is uh, another game that's like based on the animated series that does stealth. I did not include it here, but I do know of its existence. Just for the record. Lego Batman came around three years later, breathing a fun sense of spirit into the franchise. But one year after that came Arkham Asylum. Lesser known British studio Rocksteady slapped a developer pro prototype onto Eidos Interactive's desk, showing their idea for a Batman game. Eidos and Warner Brothers gave the green light, and in 2007, Rocksteady was on their way to making their Batman dream game. They grabbed legendary Batman writer Paul Dini's attention by pitching for the game to take place in its own unique universe, unconnected to the worlds created in movies and television, something so rare for Batman video games. Creating the game and story in tandem, they decided to pull from occasional depictions of Arkham's asylum for the criminally insane. Specifically, the team found themselves drawn to the creative limitations presented by Arkham being located on an isolated island separate from Gotham City. This would allow the team to write Batman into a situation where he is on the back foot, trapped and far from outside assistance, while also limiting the scope and allowing the development staff to create a small but densely packed map for the game. Grabbing from the wide world of Batman mythos, Rocksteady managed to cram so many references and inspirations into the world of Arkham Asylum, while also still managing to create something that stands out with its own visual and spiritual identity. The most complicated portion of the game's development was the combat, a give and take as they constantly worked on, scrapped, and evolved an idea for a Batman rhythm game, slowly twisting it into the juggernaut of fluid combat we know today. To maximize the Arkham map's potential, as well as the player's relationship to the Asylum, the game was given a progression system most akin to The Legend of Zelda and Metroid, itself into the genre we now refer to as Metroidvania. Casting for Arkham Asylum was confidently settled early on as the team felt there was no better performance of the main players, Batman and Joker, than with the animated series voice actors Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. Both actors would go on to portray the characters within Arkham Asylum to even greater strengths than with any of their prior, already legendary works. The further along development went, the more everything fell into place. In 21 months, Rocksteady had completed its magnum opus, a game that propelled the company, Batman, and the entire video game industry into a whole new stratosphere. Arkham Asylum was unique to the world of gaming, and doubly so in my own life. All of these characters were presented so expertly. No one felt left out in their superstardom. Even just breathing the name of a character in this game packs so much weight behind it, so much historical intrigue. To pair well with this expert classification of the character's treatment within the plot, Arkham Asylum provides its players with bios and such exquisitely well-drawn images, providing so much information in such a small area. Not only can you get to know the Rose gallery as they exist in this universe. Not only can you listen to interviews with the characters to better grasp them as individuals, but Arkham even provides you with the tantalizing detail of the first appearance of these characters. And just like that, I felt the hook sink even deeper. The characters aren't just written as though they have copious amounts of history within them. They are made to directly acknowledge the deep narrative world outside of this game. To you and me now, I'm willing to bet that this isn't all that impressive of a tidbit to note, but I can assure you, as a child, this awoke something within me that I am incapable of describing. I didn't just want to know more about these characters in their world, I needed 
to know. Luckily for everyone, I grew up in the age of the internet, and all my desires were a few clicks away. Comic book knowledge and trivia became my hobby, deep diving into the existence, first appearance, and storylines of so many of these deliciously deep villains and heroes became my vice. Where once in the past, I had encountered a single Batman comic and brushed it off as if it was nothing. Where once in the past, I had encountered a single episode of Batman the Animated Series and wrote it off as boring. Now here I stood, bathing myself in every single piece of Batman anything I could get my hands on. It was never enough though. I didn't just want to read this trivia. I wanted to know it. By heart. I didn't just want to watch these movies. I wanted to be able to recount every line of a given scene with exact perfect cadence. Give me your Nolan films. Give me your animated movies and shows. Give me your Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze. Give me your bat nipples and embarrassing snafus. I wanted it all. It was no longer good enough to just be a fan. I wasn't satisfied with just being obsessed. I wanted to become something more. I needed to become something more. Batman Arkham Asylum's gameplay has been so heavily analyzed by the internet in the many years since its release, and for good reason. In nearly every way they could, Rocksteady managed to iterate on ideas and concepts both new and old, molding the game's design in a way that so intimately marries itself to the shape of the bat. To even attempt to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of Rocksteady's implementations would be a lengthy endeavor, because truly, every angle of this game's gameplay is polished and sharpened in a way that no licensed game had ever been before, and no superhero game has ever since. That's right, I'm we're fighting today. Batman, known for his gadgets and weaponry, has a small arsenal presented in the game step by step. For every problem, Wayne Tech has provided a solution. Batarangs fly with a curve, useful more often in smaller puzzle moments than they are in actual combat. Explosive Gel finds itself incredibly situational when maneuvering through an area, but unlocks further potential in specific encounters. The cryptographic sequencer hacks into systems, providing a small minigame, disrupting the flow of gameplay but adding another layer onto the metaphor metaphorical Metroidvania-flavored onion. Midway through the game, Batman calls in the prototyped Line Launcher, its usefulness not only emphasized in the room it's obtained, but in many other aspects such as revisiting areas and stealth encounters. Stealth encounters, labeled as predator sections in Arkham, are a much-needed, well-timed break from the fast-paced. They require a more slow, calculated approach. Rooms in the asylum are tight but long. Patrolling armed guards can see each other's demise if you aren't careful. Thankfully, there are the safe havens of the gargoyles. While overused and far too useful, an initial playthrough might find these gargoyles to be evocative of the power fantasy that only Batman can provide. Predator encounters are their name, and from this vantage point, it's easy to see why. Your enemies have guns, you have the shadows. However, over time, Predator missions can become easy. Once you've gotten a grasp of the usual behavior of the guards, they become simple to manipulate, predict, and remove. This might lead one to find their existence monotonous. However, their placement in the game's narrative allows them to appear just when needed. Rather than being an overused trope, predator missions become an injection of surprises and power tripping options. The most overpowered of these options being the detective vision. The world's greatest detective is a title that Batman has so often had and yet so often not taken advantage of. In an effort to impose this detective feel into the game, Rocksteady provides the now often replicated detective vision. A button press away from near-perfect information of any given room full of enemies. In Predator missions, it's both a must-have as well as too much of a good thing. Near-perfect information provides veterans with too much ability. Encounters don't just become cakewalks, they can begin to walk the line of being uncomfortably unengaging. For the newcomers, however, it's the final piece of the puzzle that leads them down the path of becoming the feared Predator of the Asylum. With knowledge of the unknown and a vantage point within the unseen, players effectively have all the tools they need to switch what should be an unfair disadvantage into a disgustingly dangerous death trap for any armed assailant trapped in Batman's presence. The detective vision is primarily used here, but in order to inject more sleuthing potential into our caped crusader, Rocksteady has added some additional moments and encounters of tracking characters like Gordon with his tobacco trail, Boyles with his alcoholic breath, the Warden with his drops of blood. This detective work is often minimal, and nearly every 
every time leads to the same trail following procedure. It is another dull injection, an attempt of something interesting to break up the noticeably shallow sea of activities the game provides on our somewhat tiny island. Within this metaphorical sea, however, all of these elements I've discussed are nearly non-existent when compared to the overwhelming force provided by Arkham Asylum's combat. Batman Arkham Asylum wouldn't be recognized as the juggernaut of gaming that it is today had Rocksteady been so eager to cap their ambitions with something simple and expected. In place of the rudimentary beat-em-up style action sequences that plagued many games of the era, especially those depicting the Dark Knight, Batman Arkham Asylum introduced the world to the free-flow combat system. A bizarre addition to the world of gaming at the time, however, now it is looked at in an almost deific light. Free-flow combat could easily be perceived as a simple mastering of what the gaming industry has been implementing over and over with subtle changes, perhaps one of its more apt and timely comparisons being that of the Assassin's Creed combat. Simple button presses to attack, simple button presses to counter. Had Rocksteady been so inclined, they could have likely stopped at such simplicity. Batman standing in a sea of thugs as they one by one walked towards him, the player deciding when to be aggressive and when to be defensive. However, this style of combat, while containing plenty of advantages for the sake of user experience, also carries a plethora of far more complex issues. The gameplay loop can grow repetitive and stale, enemies become immensely predictable, and in the case of games like Assassin's Creed, there is a one-button solution. Stand still and counter everything thrown at you. This turtling approach would be suited fine for a game containing Batman, but the free flow system is leaps and bounds above fine. What Arkham's combat brings to the table is all those simplistic button presses while also throwing in the addition of combat gadgets, a cape stun, and takedowns to either throw an opponent wherever you please or to instantly remove them from an encounter altogether. Free flow kicks in once you have chained three of these actions together and have now officially started a combo. What separates a free flow combat combo from any other combination flurry in the video game industry lies in its rhythm and movement something that has been often replicated, but rarely duplicated. Free Flow is a combat system built off the remnants of a rhythm game. This becomes evident when playing, as you can find yourself settling into a groove. Button presses in a timed sequence, attacks when done on rhythm, can apply extra damage. Even if you're not rhythmically inclined, the Free Flow system encourages you to stay on your toes, but to also play aggressively. Passively waiting to simply counter attacks isn't enough. You'd be there ages. The counters providing very very little in terms of damage to the enemy. Stacking this with the combo number on screen, as well as the aforementioned free flow movement system, begs the player to experiment and press the attack. Flicking the stick in a direction while pressing the attack button guides Batman automatically in the direction of an enemy. His snappy movements can, at first, be jarring to the less experienced. However, once you start to click with it, you realize the power this holds. Batman can hurl himself across rooms, add a flip here or there, throw punches in a way always different from the previous. As it starts to click, a player can unlock their mental potential. Batman, in the optimal free flow system, is just a torrent of offense. You are merely directing the storm. Taking even the wimpiest of hits is enough to knock Batman out of this flow state, dropping the combo and losing the momentum. I assure you, the allure of this combat is not in the number go up department. The number is irrelevant. The joy and excitement of Arkham's combat comes from this flow state and its slow mastery. Every combat encounter is a chance to try again, to get better. Every room full of thugs is an opportunity to redeem yourself. Don't get hit this time, do it all in one combo string. While there is an XP incentive to doing so, I doubt most people would even notice. It's not about the extrinsic motivations of the game, it's all about the intrinsic motivations of the player. Perhaps either by genius or circumstance, Arkham Asylum's free flow combat system encourages you to improve incrementally, never finding true satisfaction in your performance. This idealistic, self-critical thinking is exactly like the character we control. The game, whether intended or not, is training you to not only move and operate like Batman, but now you're starting to think like him, to hunger for more, to be better, to reach out for that ever-stretching finish line of perfection.
It was no conscious decision of mine, it was just natural. Batman comics, shows, knowledge, and merchandise was my lifeblood. I became so synonymous with the icon of the Bat that people just started to know me as the Batman guy. They'd ask for quotes, they'd ask for fun facts they hadn't heard before, they'd ask about those weird obscure fellas no one knows about. I was telling people about how awesome Polka Dot Man was way back then. Now look how far my dear boy has come. The Bat symbol became my main moniker. I had countless Bat Batman shirts, I had Batman pajamas, hell, you should have seen my first car, covered in Batman iconography. I didn't buy most of that stuff, it was given to me. Voodoo is the one who decked out the interior of my car with Batman logos. My mother is the one who purchased those shirts. Nearly every present I had received for many, many birthdays, be it from friend or family, was, in one way or another, Batman themed. Hell, to this day, I am still receiving Batman related jewelry and accessories. I don't even wear jewelry. People just see the logo and think of me. That's what I mean when I say I was the Batman guy. But what a lot of these people didn't see was the rapid expansion that was happening behind the Bat symbol. Soon, I was grabbing everything I could get my hands on. This other world of fiction called to me through the absolutely stellar world of the American education system. I had grown to despise books in all of their capacity, yet comic books were liberating, intriguing. They could say so much without saying anything at all. And what about that one game I had for the GameCube, uh, Ultimate Spider-Man, yeah. Wasn't that based on a comic series of the same name? Why not pick those up? Beg my mother for a subscription to the series, getting a new issue in the mail as they were released. Comics and games, games and comics, these were great. But eventually, just these two couldn't satiate the hunger. Maybe there was more. Uh, I know there's more. There was still so much out there that had completely passed me by. My apathy as a child meant that I had cared about so little for so very long. This awakening within me was like a torrential flood, one full of new experiences, but more importantly, new revelations. One such revelation came over me. Perhaps my love for the most clown shoes and bizarre aspects of Batman's world isn't exclusive to Batman. What if I potentially love anything niche? everything bizarre. What if there's a whole world of seriously stupid entertainment out there for me to enjoy, and the only thing stopping me is me? In the year 2009, the world found itself leaning off of the campy excitement of the 80s, but also found itself fatigued by the 90s overindulgent grittiness. The pop culture zeitgeist started looking towards grounded realism. Batman himself had begun to both embrace and directly influence this change with Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins. The film depicts Batman as gritty, real, and human. Audience embraced it in droves as Batman Begins became a massive motion picture success. When Rockstar unveiled their art style for Arkham Asylum, inspirations from a serious house on serious earth were clear. However, other surrounding factors also found themselves inspiring the game's design, such as 2007's Bioshock. Just as with its references to the Batman mythos, Arkham Asylum feels like the culmination of what Batman is and certainly was at the time of its creation. Rather than going down the route of grounding Batman fully in reality, the game retains the image of comic bookiness, muscles bulge, proportions are exaggerated, everyone looks like they belong right here in the Unreal Engine, alongside their neighboring Gears of War beefcakes. Even Commissioner Gordon looks like he's gunning for the Roydy McGoo Award. Just as well, Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn find themselves cartoonishly over-sexualized. Blackgate prisoners don't just have wild tattoos, but bizarre surgical scarring. The most crazed of Arkham inmates look deranged and dangerous. Realism is here. You can see it in some of the designs and the environment, yet just as well you can see the influences of the comic lineage marked across the canvas like stray brushstrokes. Not because they are without purpose, but because without them, Arkham Asylum would start to lose a lot of its personality. The architecture of the asylum is gruesomely gothic, dilapidated and run down, in the process of being reclaimed by nature. The hanging gargoyles that litter the map imply such a cartoonishly oppressive nature, to an absurd degree. This expressionist art style shines in every 
every corner of the map. It heightens the fear and dread of isolation, both in its patients as well as you, the player. Just as well, characters in their portraits and their character models are crafted with comic book surrealism. Batman's elongated ears, Joker's misshapen jawline, Bane's oversized shoulders. The game constantly toys with the balance of what is real and what is evocative, walking the line of the serious and the stupid with a balancing act of varying results. Some may look back at this art style choice and feel it was a peculiar decision. However, I think maybe unintentionally, with this balancing act, Rocksteady nailed exactly what Batman is through the decades of iterations on The Dark Knight. Batman has seen himself take on many forms. In all of these forms, we see the reflections of culture, creators, actors, and the overall vibes of a generation. In reflection, we can see so much of pop culture and its evolution through one singular character. Surrounding him, however, we can also reflect on just how consistently absurd the extreme mythos of Batman has always been. Condiment King, Killer Moth, Polka Dot Man, Kite Man, Clock King, Egghead, King Tut, the list of straight-up goofy Batman villains is lengthy. The solutions to Batman's many sticky situations are laughable. The surreal campiness of the character occasionally oozes out of both page and screen. Whether it's Adam West's Batman needing all his gadgets to have unnecessary labels, Batman and Robin's bizarre Mr. Freeze dialogue, The Iceman cometh. Christian Bale's strange voice choice, I'm not wearing hockey pants. Or, of course, Wherever there has been a Batman, there is something goofy to point and laugh at. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through. In this way, the choice to meet in the middle of Batman Arkham Asylum's art style, evoking both realism and surrealism, leads to the perfect blend that does well for representing the many sides of the Bat. Batman isn't just some serious, gritty crime drama. Batman isn't just clown shoes buffoonery. It's both. You can't properly have one without a taste of the other. Arkham Asylum finds its blend not only here in the art style, but with the gumbo pot of selected historical moments from the Batman mythos, choosing to include a plethora of references, highlighting villains and characters both well-known and obscure, and placing itself in a clear position on a pre-established but still independent timeline. Batman is deep into his career here. His involvement with the police, the Arkham staff, and the many patients is apparent. While this helps to establish the character of Batman and his position of prominence in this world, it also helps to provide us with the understanding that this carefully crafted world isn't just thrown together Batman nonsense. Rocksteady took the time to make something truly beautiful. A world that perfectly blends all that Batman is into one prolific and powerful package. To this day and ever onward into the future, pop culture and its many surrounding aspects continue to call to me and influence me in ways I'll never be able to describe or understand. My entire left arm is covered in tattoos. These tattoos represent the multitude of interests and entertainments that have continually filled my life with immense joy. And to this day, I genuinely believe that I wouldn't have fallen in love with any of these if it wasn't for this one game, this one character. If I hadn't gotten into the comics, I would have missed out on so many incredible and impactful stories, not just in the Batman universe, but the many, many more surrounding it. Without Batman the Animated Series, would I have given anime and other forms of animation a chance? If not for the absurdity of 1960s Batman, would I have ever realized how much I love the world of campy schlock? Would I have started watching terrible movies for fun? I mean, wrestling is a massive chunk of my life, and I got into it specifically because of how ridiculously stupid I heard it was. Was. Ah, it's not hot. Would I be where I am at all today without that chance encounter? That germ-ridden kiosk in a bog-standard Walmart in a substandard town just adjacent to the one I lived in? Would life have been the same at all if it wasn't for that one fateful day? characterization in Arkham would likely be something discussed as a criticism. In the world of deep narrative experiences, I'd be inclined to agree. Batman's world is capable of containing characters dripping with intriguing and compelling character arcs. Arkham Asylum aims for none of these things. It is, at most times, simple. From its sloppy presentation of an inciting incident, all the way to its final moments containing one of the worst final boss battles ever 
of all time, Batman Arkham Asylum is sometimes caveman levels of storytelling genius. However, when you stop and look at things from just a slightly different angle, I find myself in disagreement. Rocksteady shows just how much they truly knew what they were doing with this game and its characterization with moments such as the inclusion of a lengthy intro that slowly ramps up the stakes, gradually introducing the player to the threats and dynamics of the environment, as well as providing a juxtaposition of the asylum's future state of being. This, paired with these scarecrow sequences, allows the game to occasionally slow down and really show off its pure love for the world it's taking place in. The ever-constant struggle of video game and art showing its hand, yet never tipping in one direction or the other. Batman Arkham Asylum was intelligently crafted in a way that allows itself to be the most perfectly paced onboarding process into the world of Batman and his surrounding cast, while also never being overbearing for the casual gaming audience. It is a game made to entice those who are not so narratively inclined, while also serving a palatable amount of charisma in its shockingly deep characterization. You can understand so much about characters through their brief appearances, being left with a potential yearning for more. If you are completely uninterested in the comic book side of the story, however, and are just looking for a quick bang it out video game, the Saturday morning vibe of this game's cutscenes allow them to be easy experiences brushed off as quick asides from the gameplay. Batman fans, however, may not find themselves disappointed by the simplicity, but rather endeared by it. Villains get their quick moment in the spotlight, get some play, and then they're out of there, creating a who's who all-star appearance roster without overstaying their welcome. A character often overlooked is the asylum itself. Arkham is crafted in an instantly memorable manner, with each section having interior and exterior design elements unique to themselves. The medical wing is designed to evoke the terror and dread of the worst hospitals imaginable. The sewers are given wide tunnels of brick, paired with narrow hallways of crumbling structures. The archives are given a feeling of an ever-stretching wooden library. The penitentiary has a sense of high-tech oppression. The botanical gardens are given an overgrowth effect of fantasy book proportions. No matter where you turn in the asylum, the map is crafted with this intense and memorable observation. It is over-the-top in its cartoonish violence and patient mistreatment. It's chilling in its horrific implications. As you uncover more information about its founder, you realize that none of this is by accident. Arkham's Asylum for the Criminally Insane is a place of inhumane atrocities that, even when only given the most surface level of observations, still stands out in the player's memory long after the credits roll. The majority of dialogue in Arkham belongs to the devilishly talented Mark Hamill, with what I'd argue is his best portrayal of the Joker. Across all iterations of the Clown Prince of Crime, we have seen the evolution of his chaos. The distortion of his desires have shifted and evolved. The character remains malleable enough that slapping on a fresh coat of face paint can result in a Joker that feels new and exciting, or a disappointingly simple outline of a villain lacking substance. Here in Arkham, Joker shines, providing monologues, adding observations, overall being memorable and genuinely funny in so many ways. So, you wanna play hardball bats, do ya? Your call. <laughs> pickle, pickle. He's letting loose and goofing it up. Arguably, he's doing it so well that Joker finds himself almost elevated to the position of being the most interesting anything in all of the Arkham series. That will be important later. In the shadow of Joker's radiance is Batman himself. Kevin Conroy provides voice to his most iconic of roles with a more subdued, serious, calm calculation. Batman is seemingly never in a situation that he can't overcome. Even when he's caught off guard at the beginning of the game, allowing Joker's escape, it's only done after providing skepticism of Joker's easy capture. This interpretation of the Bat continues to contain more and more evidence towards who exactly this version of Bruce Wayne is. Without ever stepping over the line of Shakespearean asides. Batman narrates to himself and the player. Detective Vision gives him access to knowledge outside of mortal expectation. His gadgets allow him solutions that always feel natural, even when so wildly specific. However, just to add one layer of complexity to its otherwise surface-level characterization, Arkham throws in its Scarecrow scenes. Within the clouded judgment of Scarecrow's fear toxin, Bruce encounters the thing he fears most, the reopening of the wounds he carries with him 
at all times. In the first, he sees his parents' corpses, Thomas and Martha Wayne, as they express their disappointment in him, the very representation of reason as to why he does what he does, put in front of him to mock his purpose. One encounter sees Batman being taken to Arkham, hands bound. He fears that he's just as crazy as the inmates he drags to the asylum's depths. Most vital to the Batman experience, however, we re-experience the traumatic, inciting incident. Not through a cutscene, but a long walk down an ever-stretching hallway, representing Crime Alley where it all began. Over all noise, we can hear the night play out in Bruce's mind. His father rushing them down the alley, his mother screaming in fear, the gunshots that robbed the young philanthropist of its future, creating the Batman. The moment is an opening of old wounds, an experience of replaying the trauma carried by our hero. However, it is this moment that also defines the character. In his fear, he is formed. Scarecrow intends to cripple Batman with this manifestation. Instead, he reminds Bruce and the player what this is all for, where it all started. In the many iterations of Batman, there have been countless changes, additions, and alterations to his character. In some, he is the brooding, scary shadow of the night. In others, he is a remarkably charming ball of quirkiness. Regardless, every version of the Bat that's worth a damn has a few aspects that have always remained consistent. At times, I fear that Bat fans the world over are missing what truly makes Batman shine above all other heroes. Batman isn't so simple as to be represented by his Bat symbol or his multitude of gadgets. He is so much more beyond that. The superhero's foundations are built upon an unshakable moral code, in which he follows despite everything. You can disagree with the code, you can hate the code, you can criticize and critique it all day, but that's not quite the point. See, Batman's code is so important to the character because of how it emphasizes a core value that is shared throughout the many incredible iterations of The Dark Knight. It's not so much about the part where Batman refuses to kill, it's the the part where he refuses to be like those he opposes. It's not so much about the part where Batman is vengeance, it's about the part where he is justice. It's never been about Batman being a superhero, it's always been about him being just like us. Bruce Wayne was a child, dealt a terrible hand by fate, his parents murdered in an alley right in front of his eyes. Typically, no matter who the storyteller is, this journey into the fate-altering alleyway is just circumstance. In one version, the alley is an attempt for this wealthy and powerful family to avoid riots and gangs in the streets of Gotham. In countless others, the alley is just presented as a shortcut to get to Alfred and the car just a little faster. No matter the justification, Batman's origins are are presented in this manner that reminds us that tragedy could have been avoided. This chance encounter didn't have to happen like this, but it did. Fate altered the trajectory of Bruce Wayne's life, so in his place, Batman rose to attempt to alter the trajectory of fate. Rocksteady's Arkham Asylum went on to sell absolute gangbusters, blowing expectations out of the water, impressing critics and fans alike. Its reception wasn't just some sort of flash-in-the-pan experience. Arkham Asylum went on to both subtly and overtly influence the landscape of the gaming world for the rest of, well, possibly forever. Games have been attempting their version of the Arkham-style combat ever since release. Some get close, some try new funky spins on the formula, none ever get close to the true joy of the experience. It's an understatement to say that free-flow combat radically revitalized a sub-genre of third-person gaming that was beginning to see a sunset. On the flip side, Predator stealth sections also influenced gaming in ways perhaps imperceptible. Nowadays, games like Spider-Man can't avoid having stealth sections despite it not being particularly fitting for the character, likely in large part to Arkham, introducing the pacing of action, adventure, and stealth in such a satisfying and full manner. Uh, speaking of, the pacing of Arkham added so much to the world of gaming. Its hurried approach allowed the player to get in and out with proper play and precision, feeling like a refreshing addition to a world slowly leaning in the lengthy direction of open world. With this, Arkham continued to press itself into a legacy status as it made for a replayable, memorable shotgun blast of an experience. With many copycats coming for the crown, you'd think Rocksteady would find themselves eventually overpowered by the wider world of video game development, and yet, 
No. Arkham Asylum still continues to stand on its own victories, unconquerable. Before anyone could ever truly rival their position of power, Rocksteady would come back with a one-up on themselves. In only two years, Rocksteady would deliver the perfect sequel that evolves and iterates on everything presented. Batman's name would be elevated from a position of laughable mediocrity to one of legendary gaming status. And this accomplishment is all on the shoulders of the hard work and creativity of this one company. Rocksteady's influence with this elevation can be felt, not just throughout the entire gaming industry, but especially in the world of superheroes. Once, they were merely a guarantee of terrible movie tie-in games. Now, superheroes reign over the gaming space with consistent releases that experiment and dare to stand on their own. Yet, in each of them, a little hint of Arkham flavoring can be detected. Rocksteady's Batman doesn't just shine in the shallow pool of video games. This version of Batman, his villains, and the depiction of Arkham stands out in the world of Batman's entire mythos. This version of the Dark Knight cementing itself in the character's legacy for the rest of history. Arguably, being so influential in the massive swing in popularity that makes Batman such an icon in today's modern vision. Inarguably, being the reason why I stand here as the hair you know today. What's incredible about the character of Batman is what he has done with the series of misfortunes to befall him. Rather than succumbing to the misery, he turned around and made use of it. He weaponized that pain and turned it into something constructive for the city of Gotham. His lasting change impacts the world around him, small and large. In some versions, it's the legacy he leaves behind with the Bat family. In some stories, it's the entire city itself that carries his name and his symbol. Batman is for the people, just as much as he is the people. People. A lot of poorer writers get this part of Batman wrong so often. The reason why it's so important to emphasize Batman's unshakable morals is because that is the caped crusader's power. He doesn't have super strength. He has a body that he spent countless hours off screen honing and training as to handle most any encounter. He doesn't have the ability to move things with his mind. Bruce Wayne just spent many years playing Brain Age on the DS in order to craft his brain into that of the world's greatest detective. What makes Batman so incredible as a superhero is that he is so very human. More than any other superhero, he is us. Determination, practice, discipline, a desire to see the world better than what it currently is. That is what makes the Dark Knight Batman. I know that's not the thing that made my eyes dart to Batman. If I'm being honest, you see very little of that humanity in Rocksteady's version of the Bat. However, this enriched, deeper understanding of the character is what keeps me so in love. It's what keeps me thinking about him so often. Batman, through so many means and invisible influences, has impacted me in various ways I'll never be able to fully account for. I will never be able to leave the world with a long-lasting impact. I'm confident in that. But perhaps, with this video, I can encourage someone else to share their story like I've shared mine. To reflect in ways that we don't usually allow ourselves. To look at ourselves and analyze what is at the core of what makes us, us. My life is full of passions, and those passions so intimately make up the story of my life. And certainly, it's not something that's applicative to everyone. But at the epicenter of everything I love and adore in this life, at the center of the things that make me recognize me is that kiosk in Walmart with the Batman logo emblazoned across its worn out screen. Batman is so integral to the world on large. He makes up the foundations of pop culture itself. I truly believe this for a fact, but even if you disagree, you can't refute one thing for certain. Batman is my cornerstone of pop culture. Thank you so much for watching. This was a pretty big passion project, and it was very important that I got it out today of all days, because at the time of this video going live, it is my birthday. And so I wanted to celebrate my birthday by having a video that was very personal. So if you sat through all of this, thank you so much. That means a lot. That being said, hey, if you really want to wish me a happy birthday, uh, there's a lot of videos on this channel that I think are probably better than this one. I don't know. 
you'll have to watch them and tell me your thoughts. In the meantime, if you really just can't get enough of me, there is a members program here on YouTube, as well as a Patreon. Through both of them, you can support me and all of these endeavors. For only a dollar a month, you also get access to an exclusive monthly show where I just sit down and talk about whatever I feel like talking about. Just around the corner is April, and April 1st is this channel's one year anniversary. That's pretty huge considering that at the time of completing this video, we have 1,850 subscribers, and our highest watched video is at 72,000 views. So I think for only being around for a year, that's actually pretty good, in my opinion. Thank you to everyone that's treated me very well. I'll probably have a video that's going to be a sort of state of the channel update on April 1st, so look forward to that. Regardless, again, thank you so much for watching, and, well, I'll catch you down the road. Be excellent to each other.